Welcome. My name is Joe Davidge, and I'm the executive director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, the DeKalb County Public Library, DeKalb Library Foundation, the Decatur Arts Alliance, and the Downtown Decatur Development Authority, welcome to our second in our series of author artist talks that coincide with the book is art, Muse our gallery exhibition here at the Decatur Library, featuring book objects from around the world. Before we begin this evening's presentation, I would like to remind you of a few things. After we finish our formal presentation, if you would like to ask the artist any questions, please feel free to do so by typing your question into the Q&A feature so that we can keep better track of it. You'll find the Q&A button located at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on your device. We've also enabled live transcription for those of you who are hearing impaired and need that accommodation. You can find the live transcription by locating the CC button either at the top or bottom of your screen and clicking on it and then you can resize the font to any size you desire. I'd also like to remind you of an upcoming talk in this series next week, September 15th. It's our third and final talk and will feature artists Angia Kuna, Fran Goodfriend, and Sarah Quinn. You can find our events by going to georgiacenterforthebook.org or you can go to our Eventbrite page as well. You can find the links to those over in the chat. We also encourage you to visit our YouTube channel. Not only does it have the gallery show to where you can take a virtual tour of this year's show, but we also have our old artist talks and virtual gallery tour archive there as well. And feel free to subscribe and like the videos and don't forget to turn on notifications for when we post not only artist talks, but talks in our continuing author series as well. Right now, I would like to go ahead and introduce our artists this evening and get the event to get started. Thomas Camp is a retired social studies teacher and self-taught photographer. In addition to his work counting sheep, he has photographed subjects that lean towards storytelling. Some examples include the Edward Payson Weston Six Day Race, the Cowtown Rodeo, and the Philadelphia Boxing Club. The majority of his work is centered in South Jersey and Philadelphia. Steve Diver has worked with books for more than 30 years. Diver uses books as objects and text-based art to explore a sense of place in the world. He has traveled to Cuba regularly since 2001, where he partners with local artists to create art books through Red Trillium Press, Aquí La Lucha. Cronica Insular is a trilogy based on the facilitated dialogues and themes Cuban artists describe in their social and political relationships. Poder was published in 2010, Privacidad in 2011, and La Espera in 2013. Diver also engages with the landscape directly through site-specific book installations, interventions in the forests, and prints from the remnants of past commercial timbering. For 23 years, Diver has been adding to a wall of books that acts as a property line on the land where he lives in Massachusetts. Diver carries the books on his back through the woods from his local library to the corner of his property, where he leaves them exposed to years of natural decay. Jillian Slico is a papermaker, printmaker, and bookbinder who makes works under the imprint Frog Song Press. She received a Master's in the Arts of Anthropology from the University of Georgia in 2013 and a Master's in the Fine Arts of Book Arts from the University of Alabama in the spring of 2020. She currently lives in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, where she works from her home studio and teaches courses in fine and interdisciplinary art. So right now I would like to welcome all three artists and we're going to begin our evening by talking to Thomas Camp, whose work Counting Sheep is in the Book is Art exhibition this year. Thomas? Hello. Hello. My name is Thomas Camp. My book is Counting Sheep. I have, in terms of contents, 46 prints with two pages of text where I highlight my initial meeting with Charlene and Ken Carlisle. They're black and white photographs, one photo per page without titles, with no photographs 
that span two pages and with a linear approach. Overall, I think the book format for my purposes is best for viewing photographs. As a storyteller, oftentimes the photographs need to support each other. One photograph leads into another and thus they tell a story. The farm is located in Morristown, New Jersey. The name is Little Hooves Sheep Farm. I photographed on and off for three years and my concentration was primarily the sheep. Even though what initially drew me to the farm was how bucolic it was, uh, beautiful pastoral scenes amidst the sheep. I have been photographing for 50 years. I started to get into what is now called, what has been called documentary. And my first uh, assignment that I gave myself was photographing a six day race, which actually began in 1868 and pretty much died by the advent of bicycling in 1903. But a close friend of mine who was an ultra marathoner resurrected the race in the 1980s. And I photographed that for eight summers uh, and subsequently uh, I exhibited that work at the New Jersey State Museum. This led me to what I think is my forte, namely uh, storytelling. And oftentimes in telling the story, one photograph has to lead into another. Oftentimes they may not be art on their own, but occasionally one photograph can be singled out and not necessarily need the support of the other photographs to prop it up. And I guess we end up calling that art. Uh, I really want to thank Decatur Art Alliance for the privilege of me being able to speak with you. And I look forward to uh, my relationship with the uh, Art Alliance in the future. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Thomas, for your presentation. And now we'd like to turn it over to Stephen Diver. Stephen Diver's book in the Book is Art exhibition this year is called Rolling Havana. Stephen? Okay. Oops. Let me. Uh... So, um, thanks for including me in this exhibition. Uh, now I can look at myself. Uh, Roiling Havana is about um, Obama's visit in 2016 uh, when he visited Havana, uh, Havana and uh, we thought the world was going to change. Uh, at this, I was reading the text a little while ago and um, was amazed at, at just how hopeful, um, at least I was um, in my writing and um, how skeptical the Cubans were. Uh, I've been going to Havana since 2001 and 
Uh, I've done a number of books using uh, the Cuban Atlas as a uh, background material and creating a palimpsest of images and text uh, to describe these visits. I couldn't figure out how to uh, share my screen, but I do want to put up, um, and if Ali could do that while I'm talking, just a few images um, that I've sent her. Um, so this is. Unknown caller. I'm uh, sorry, I'm getting spammed. Um, as you can see, it's it's the atlas. Um, and across the top pages is a collage of uh, text uh, newspapers from Obama's uh, visit, uh, images off the TV screen. Zika virus was there. So we were getting uh, fumigated uh, weekly, uh, which was just absolutely horrendous. Um, also in that time, um, not only did Obama arrive, but the Rolling Stones showed up, um, finishing their last tour. Um, and I just, so I just want to read a couple of passages um, that just gives you a flavor of what was happening at that moment. Um, and I asked a couple of Cuban um, individuals to write along with me, one is Gladys Linares, who is a 78 year old um, retired teacher. And she's pretty bitter. She, her family lost their uh, business when the revolution happened. Um, and the rest of her family fled to Miami. Um, and I don't know if you can hear this in the background, but somebody's drilling in my building. Um, so she says, indeed, Obama achieved his goal to reestablish relationships between both governments. However, the indispensable bond between both peoples already has deep roots. Cubans and Americans fought together during the 13 colonies war for independence and also during the Cuban wars for independence from the Spanish colonialism in 1868 and 1895. After the Cuban Republic was born in 1902, many North Americans came to Cuba to settle and help us rebuild our country. Um, she goes on to say, during these days of March 2016, Cubans hardly spoke of about any other subject beside the visit. We temporarily forgot the scarcity, the misery, the lack of freedom. The press did not reflect on the incidents of the visit, but these anecdotes were transmitted mouth to mouth. If people greeted them, Obama, during their walks through Old Havana, they ate Congri and Ropa Vieja in a restaurant recommended by a friend. Um, she finishes by saying, the feeling of change and hope went on for some time, further intensified by the concert of the British rock band Rolling Stones, who included their Latin American tour. And for some days, Cubans, especially those who lived in Havana, were able to glimpse what it was like to be part of the larger world. Um, so that was in 2016 and the world has changed a lot. And I don't know if you follow the news, things are really dire in Cuba. Um, when the Soviets pulled out, they called it the special period and people didn't starve, but they had very little food. Now they're starving um, and it's just dire beyond dire. The, um, The second person I asked to write was a young video um, game maker, and he's trying to make a video game in Cuba when at that time the fastest was dial up. Um, uh, this image, that's Mick Jagger uh, there on a giant LED screen. Um, he actually wasn't that tall, as, as a friend of mine pointed out. He really was. We were that far away. So he was only about an inch tall. 
Um, but it was an amazing concert, um, far different than any American one that I'd ever been to. Um, there was a, there really was hope and euphoria um, at that time that Obama visited. Um, he's a bit more, he's, he's pretty skeptical. Many Cubans do not like Obama anymore. Among his latest executive decisions was to eliminate the dry feet, wet feet policy. The last redoubt for those who, for various reasons, do not want to continue living on the island of their origin. Some, on the contrary, prefer to remember him as the nice guy, the one seen making jokes on Panfilo, which is a Cuban TV show, quoting Jose Marti, or making an effort to speak bad Spanish. For others, he'll always be the eternal enemy, some sort of evil nemesis arrived from the north with the sole purpose of destroying our immaculate socialist freedom. For me, his visit was nothing more than another antidote lost like many others inside a story that has become a huge antidote itself. Um, he goes on to say he wasn't a fan of the Rolling Stones. Um, he doesn't like their music. He thought it was old people playing old songs. Excuse me. Um, and wished he could actually have um, heard Nirvana, but Kurt Cobain was already dead. There's, um, they're waiting. It's Aspera, the wait. Um, they're just waiting for change. When they, when Fidel died, they, people thought, well, maybe there'll be a change and there's not. And now with COVID, it's just, a sad, dire um, environment there, according to my friends. And I really don't know when I'll be back, maybe next January, but you know, it's, it's up to COVID. Thanks, that's all I've got to say. Awesome, thank you so much, Stephen, for that wonderful presentation. And now we'd like to turn it over to our final artist for the evening, Jillian Seco, whose book, My Carize, is on display right behind me. Jillian? <clears throat> Thank you so much for having me. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and share my screen because I do have some process photos that I'd like to share. Oh, and also I have a kitten, uh, four months old, who is crazy right now. So, all right. <clears throat> so my book is called Mycorrhizae, um, which might not be a familiar term to everybody. So I thought I'd just go ahead and define what that is. So a mycorrhiza singular is the symbiotic association of a mycelium of a fungus with the roots of a seed plant. And the mycelium, in case you're unaware, is the um, sort of root-like structures that are underground. Um, so most of the fungus is actually hidden from view um, and is connected with the roots of trees, plants, um, most garden plants. And uh, there's been a lot of interest in this lately. There's been some books written about it. Um, there's a movie called Fantastic Fungi that talks about this. And one of the terms that's used is the wood wide web. And it's kind of like an internet for the forest where the mycorrhizae, um, which is the fungus and the roots connect to each other and they, uh, they send information back and forth, information like whether there are pests attacking one tree, um, uh, they also exchange nutrients that are essential to the survival of the plants and forests. So I decided to make a book edition about this um, last year and uh, I used a combination of different handmade papers um, the entire book is handmade paper and it's very process oriented. So I wanted to spend this presentation kind of talking about my process and, um, and also my research that I did. Um, this is an edition of 22 housed in a clamshell box. Um, it has two different books, a larger artist book, which is an accordion format and a smaller informational pamphlet. 
So I decided to collaborate with an ecologist on this project and uh, it just so happened that a renowned bookbinder Brian Beidler's wife, Katie, uh, is an ecologist who studies mycorrhizae. So he came for a workshop and we got to talking and he put me in touch with her and she actually wrote the text for the informational pamphlet. Um, and I wanted to have that because I knew that I was going to be as an artist exploring the topic in kind of a more personal and poetic way. So I wrote the text for the artist book and it's kind of like more of a personal exploration of loss and connectivity um, thinking about those underground connections that exist in the forest. And Katie wrote this informational piece about what mycorrhizae are and their importance to um, ecosystems. So I chose a research site that I felt really connected to and had been to several times uh, called Dikahata Wilderness. Um, if you're in Atlanta, that's possibly familiar to you. It's uh, just up in the far kind of north west portion of the state, really close to Tennessee. And it's part of the Chattahoochee National Forest. And I had a flip phone at the time. So that is the uh, written instructions to get to my campsite. Um, I camped out there a total of, I think 10 to 12 days. And I just kind of set up um, and I was drawing in the woods um, journaling usually at night by the light of like a headlamp or a lantern. And I just really wanted this book to be rooted in place. So I spent as much time as I could up there and did as much of the sort of thinking and process um, as I could while I was up in the Cojeda. Um, yeah, this is like some of the journaling that I did while I was there, just trying to focus on like rise, focus on the ideas of connectivity. And I ended up uh, having my text come directly from these journal entries, um, edited, of course, but I, um, I realized at some point that I had written enough to have the text of my book. Um, I went walking on trails. And this is an image that I, or a photograph that I took on one of the trails up there that ended up being the basis for my imagery in the artist book. Um, so I did a quick sketch of that. And eventually I used wood veneer to print the trees. And I'll talk more about the sort of gray uh, ethereal stuff going on on the ground. Um, oh, my cat is biting my feet. Okay. <clears throat> Some of the other imagery came from looking at soil samples through a microscope. So I collected soil from several different species that I knew were tree species that I knew were mycorrhizal and I started looking at those under a microscope. The little white fuzzy parts are the fungus. And I used kind of broadly used some of that imagery that I had sketched while looking through the microscope for um, for these little um, mycelium looking things on the outside of the book. And then also for some watermarks that I made in Kozo using puffy paint and for a couple of images in the middle of the book. Cat, stop. Okay. Um, for the informational pamphlet, I decided to just do scans of roots. So I collected again from these soil samples, some, uh, some roots and Katie Beidler also had some root scans that she already had done from her lab um, in Indiana. And uh, so I then manipulated these in Adobe Illustrator and uh, made, oh my goodness, sorry, <laughs> and made plates out of them, um, and then printed these letterpress. And these are some of the first proofs of the root scans. And here are the finished letterpress printed um, images with the letterpress printed text in the informational pamphlet. So in terms of paper making, um, I had several different kinds of paper that I used for the interior sheets, some of the interior sheets of the uh, artist book. I used Alabama Kozo, which is paper mulberry, Brucinicia papyrifera, uh, that I harvested here in town. Had friends help me do some of the scraping. And I also used a little bit of lake water from up in the Cahuta wilderness, just to add some slate, uh, like flotsam and jetsam. And then this is uh, the water marking that I did. So I used puffy or dimensional paint um, and just made these little uh, 
like root D mycelium -y, um, patterns and was able to make some nice watermarks in the COZO paper. And this is an image from the centerfold of the artist book, um, which has white pages behind it. So you can see the watermarks as you turn the page. I also used linen that I had purchased from the base of the Cahada Mountains in an antique store. And some of it I also got from a friend of mine. And I decided to bury a portion of it underground to, to ret, which is a kind of word that we use for decomposition in paper making. And I buried it at the base of this uh, beautiful old poplar tree that was sort of half burned out, possibly from the Rough Ridge wildfire that happened there a few years back. And when I dug it up two months later, it was covered in white mycelium and it had broken down quite a lot so that you could just tear it apart by hand. And I had linen soaking in water in Tuscaloosa here where I live um, for the same amount of time and it was not even nearly so broken down. Oops. So I decided to beat it in a mechanical paper beater, a Hollander beater with just rinsing it and not cooking it. So in the book, um, there's probably fungi and you know all sorts of kind of microorganisms in there still, um, which I hope will eventually overtake the book one day. Um, so this is an image of a, the sort of gray sheet on the right is the 100% tree redded linen. And then the paper that is the accordion is made out of is a mixture of uh, linen that was just soaked in water, tree redded linen, and a little bit of raw flax. And this is a close up of the tree redded linen. Um, for the background of the artist book, I used charcoal that was from the base of that same burnt out tree and I sifted and strained it. Um, and then I formed sheets using a deco box method where I swirled some of the charcoal in with the pulp um, and then pulled out a plastic sheet and that resulted in these kind of organic smoke-like or fog-like markings on the book. And you can see that there, it looks different on the outside of the book versus the inside, which looks more like ground. Um, and then I also made recycled paper for the uh, informational pamphlet and I decided to put some chanterelle mushroom spores in that paper again with this idea that like if there's spores in the paper maybe it could be buried and grow mushrooms out of it and maybe mushrooms would just start growing on it if it got wet enough um, so you know most book artists might be thinking of wanting to make archival books um, and mine is semi-archival, but also prone to growing fungi on it probably, which I like. Um, this is an image of the pamphlet and the cover, oops. The cover, which is pictured here, also has some um, just polypore mushroom pulp in it. Um, I experimented with making pure 100% mushroom paper. Um, and that was really interesting, but not so good for this particular project but the cover is a mixture of the recycled paper and that mushroom pulp. Um, and that's a close-up of the cover of the informational pamphlet. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's the book in a nutshell. Um, and I wanted to thank all these people as well as the Georgia Center for the Book um, for having me here today. And if you wanna follow me on Instagram, please do. <laughs> Maybe you can hear my cat playing in the background too. Excellent. Thank you so very much, Jillian. That was a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And don't forget, if you would like to ask any of our artists tonight a question, please feel free to type it into the chat or to the Q&A feature so we can have those answered for you in turn. So after listening to all of your presentations, what, what struck me is that you all are very rooted in your art being rooted in a place, whether it be the forest in North Georgia or in Cuba or in a farm. How important is it for you as artists to
to go to those places and to have those places be reflected so greatly in your art. I was unable to hear that. Uh, could you, would you mind repeating that question? Oh, sure, Thomas, not a problem. I was asking about how all of your books are very much rooted in place at the farm, North Georgia and Cuba. How important to you is it to you as artists to have that kind of connection to a place within your art rather than just, um, you know, like a lot of the pieces in the exhibition are sort of like a reflection on a theme or a reflection on a place but don't really, the artists haven't gone to a particular site in order to get inspiration or to take the photographs and things like that. A lot of the, the subjects that I uh, shoot uh, tend to be uh, related to uh, history. Uh, my degrees are in history uh, and political science. And so I have a connection to place. Um, and initially when I started photographing, and, and to some extent I'm still doing this, I was a street photographer and uh, that uh, led me eventually to wanting to uh, restrict my topics uh, in such a way that I could explore them in depth and as we said earlier, the first one that I did was of the race. Uh, and <clears throat> interestingly, I think uh, oftentimes I'm choosing subjects that I may not uh, want to participate in. Uh, for example, Cowtown Rodeo um, uh, or, or the Philadelphia Boxing Club. Um, uh, but at the same time, it's grounded in history uh, to such an extent I really want to explore um, uh, beyond just uh, through observation. I want to know more about the uh, subject. Stephen, what about you? I mean, because, you know, your book it, it involves so many points in history, a visit from the Rolling Stones, Obama and things like that. How, how important is it to, for you to center your work in Cuba? Um, well, there's two, there's essentially two bodies of work. There's my landscape work before Cuba, and then Cuba showed up in my life. Um, but wherever I am and, and the material I choose to work with is very much centered on um, place and uh, uh, a deep exploration into um, what that environment is and how um, how I'm living in it, what I see, um, how it's affecting me, how it's affecting other people. Um, with Cuba, it's the you know it's certainly there's a lot of politics um, involved. Um, that seems to be an overriding. Um, theme. My natural history work is um, incredibly intimate. It's, um, it's my backyard. Um, I'm in it every day. Um, I'm watching uh, books decay um, daily. Um, you know, I'm, I'm drawing the landscape. Uh, you know, we have bears running through our yard, deer, um, I'm very fortunate that way. It's so it's it's very much steeped in a personal exploration of, of uh, my environment and community. Jillian, what about you? Yeah, so um, I have tried to make work that is not rooted in place, and I struggle a lot to do that. Um, I just am a person that whenever I move somewhere or even visit somewhere, I immediately find a natural place and I go and like I kind of hook myself onto it. And that's where I do my best thinking and where I guess I just feel like more free as a person. So I think my work has always been and will always be rooted in place. Um, even my not 
artistic work, but the work that I did in anthropology was always very rooted in environment and place, so. Well, and it seems to me also just, you know, a quick observation, both you and Steve have this, um, it, it almost seems like a, you know, you view your books as something that, that is going to decay and, and you know, with, with Steve and, and his wall of books and, you know, with you infusing your book with, with um, um, mushroom spores that, that, you know, folks kind of, you know, especially authors like to think their book and their work is going to live on through the ages. And, you know, yet in your artistic works, you know, you both know that these things are going to decay and that, you know, there's a sense of impermanence to them, but there's a beauty in the impermanence to them. Yeah, there's a part of me that wants the libraries and the galleries to just be like overtaken by wild things eventually. And, you know, in some way that's inevitably going to happen anyways. So why not just accelerate it a little bit? Um, you're going to you're going to give uh, all sorts of uh, curatorial staff and preservationists <laughs> partner. Absolutely. Um, I work with unwanted books and, and let them decay. You're actually being a bit braver and including all of that. Um, so it's sort of a, uh, it's a time bomb. It's uh, <laughs> I do have to admit when, when Jillian, you did mention that you had the spores in the book, you know, because sometimes, um, you know, Emery has a book collection, a book art collection, and they purchase things. And I thought to myself, oh, wow, <laughs> you know, if there's spores in that book and it's sitting over at Emery, <laughs> you know, would this like all of a sudden sprout if something happened? And should we warn them that it has the possibility to sprout mushrooms? Um, it's it's in the colophon, so they're purchasing the pro the mushrooms as well. <laughs> you know, if I could add, sure. Um, yes, I I am actually more concerned with preserving my books. Um, I am a book collector, and specifically, I collect photography books since 1970, and I don't want them to die. <laughs> I want to. I want to preserve them. And sure enough, I don't I'm want going to die, die, but I don't want them to die. And, I, and now the question is, where did I go? And the topics. And the topics tend to be uh, pretty esoteric. Uh, they're not how-to books. They're monographs. Many of them signed. Many of them from the people that I've met, like Ansel Adams and Aaron Siskin, and Paul Caponegro more recently. Um, I, I, uh, I want to pass them on, but it's really difficult to give away 150 bucks. Yeah. So I don't want them to die. <laughs> well, you know, I always quote one of my old college professors, and he was a great professor of children's literature, and he always used to say that you're not going to read every book you own before you die, but you'll die knowing that you own them. And I always wanted to have that stitched on a pillow somewhere close because it's like, exactly, you know, book lovers, this is, you know, our mantra at some point. Steve, I did want to get back to you because, um, you know, Roiling Havana too is, is a, almost like a transform book. It take, takes the Atlas of Cuba and, and then uses you know, um, the printing on top of it to, to express these historical events. Did you find the Atlas first and that became your inspiration or did you know what you wanted to do and then sourced that particular piece of material to express your thoughts on the subject? I've used um, Atlas de Cuba on, I don't know, five or six, seven, eight books. It's a it's an ongoing theme um, through my work. Uh, there's also an artist, Ibrahim Miranda, a Cuban artist that uses that particular atlas. That's a, that was published in 1979. So it's the 20th anniversary. Um, it's 
an amazingly beautiful book, um, incredibly thorough in its um, research. Uh, and so it's, it's, you know, it's looking at, at the history of, of the revolution for the first 20 years and then what I lay on top of it. Um, so I'm searching for a dialogue between the two. And I, even before I came across this, I was using atlases in my own work. So it was a natural progression when I found this book um, to use it. And then I met Ibrahim who's been making, um, printing long scrolls um, of that. But, you know, the next time I go back, um, I will probably make another book um, about what I see and use that same same material. I said that's wonderful. Thomas, since your work involves photography, um, in particular black and white photos, why did you choose black and white for the <laughs> photography? You know, we had a discussion last week with Kyle Clark. And he had a, a wonderful series of photos. And in his presentation, he showed us that some of the photographs were actually in color originally, but he reprocessed them in black and white for a particular book that we have in the exhibition. So why did you choose black and white for your photographs? I, I think because uh, color tends to be distracting. Uh, that's, that's the main reason why I, I'm not uh, adverse to color, um, but there's certain photographs that are about the color. And then there's some photographs that tend to be stronger in black and white. And I think black and white oftentimes uh, uh, is, can be more powerful. And oh, yeah. I, initially, when I started out, um, yes. At one initially, moment. when I started out, um, I, I was drawn to Ansel Adams. And Ansel Adams, as you know, did these magnificent uh, nature photographs, particularly out west. And everything was in black and white. And I studied Ansel Adams. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, definitely some very pastoral connections as well. And you can, you know, especially in the scenery in back, kind of see a very, almost like Ansel Adams Western-like horizon to it. That would be quite a compliment. <laughs> Are you, have you heard? Well, in, in Jillian too, in your, your book using the charcoal, it almost does have a, you know, a black and white photographic kind of, of look to it with the trees just sort of, you know, forming a wonderful line across that accordion. It kind of like draws you along across the accordion. <laughs> Yeah, I, I definitely also tend towards like black and white and neutral colors. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure why, but I like the simplicity of it. And in this case, the photograph that I took was actually basically black, white, and gray. So um, yeah, I mean, it, I, and the charcoal, of course. Yeah, I, I, yours seemed to be a very labor intensive process too with, you know, making the paper and letting things run and, and then doing the charcoal, you know, and, and I like seeing, you know, your, your, your dirty hands in it. It almost seems that, you know, you really wanted not only to express with the book and become one with the book, but also, you know, be a part of the natural process as yeah. well. Yeah. I mean, it, it was important for me to have process be part of the book and also just like, yeah, getting dirty and getting in there because that was my way of connecting with the mycorrhizae. Um, and that was what I was trying to do this whole time by visiting the site and by reading the fiber under a tree is like, 
how can I understand the mycorrhizae in this more personal way? Um, so yeah, getting dirty was definitely part of the process. <laughs> Well, I, I know we all have, you know, been, been, you know, quarantining or sheltering, you know, during this whole time, but what are you all working on now? And what are you finding inspiration in now as we're sort of coming out of the pandemic just slightly, but, but what are you looking forward to working on in the future as well? Well, Jillian? Oh yeah, Steven? Um, walking it's there's a oh there's a book out there about walking there's actually there's a lot of books out there about walking um but i've i've made one which is actually about walking in cuba as a necessity and uh this um this particular project i'm working on um very much in the gestation stage but um i see it coming to fruition in about two years. Um, that's, that's some definite long-term planning for a project too. Well, I've got to walk the walk first. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, are you working on anything currently or do you have plans uh, for a book? Right now I've been photographing my grandchildren. <laughs> uh, I'm having fun doing that. Uh, we're indoors. We don't have to worry about uh, what's out there. But uh, I, I find uh, that I don't typically go looking for subjects. Um, uh, in, in some sense, they find me. And um, for example, with boxing, Bill Lyons, I used to read uh, the sports page in the Inquirer. I thought he was a great writer. And he's the one that I read about Gage Jim at Wharton and Passion in Philly. And I decided to just go in one day and talk to Gabe and he said, you can photograph as you wish, just give me a couple of photographs to put on the wall. And uh, that's really what I find. I, I don't go seeking subjects. I went to a, a, a church in Bordentown, uh, St. Mary's, Bordentown, New Jersey. And I was struck by the stained glass windows. So I saw the pastor and I asked him to, if I could come in and bring a step ladder and photograph all the stained glass windows. That's and I, I did 15 gl uh, glass windows and then I did parts of each window. And, we and I was intrigued, and this is how the history comes into this, that a, no one really knew who did the windows. He was pretty certain that they go back 100 years. And when I did my research, I narrowed it down to Austria. And so, so that, that's the, uh, the melding of history and art for me. Jillian, are you working on anything currently or have anything planned? Uh, currently, it's hard to say because I'm teaching and working, <laughs> um, but I am working slowly, I, yeah, very slowly, on a book about uh, the Eastern Hemlock, which is under attack by the Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. Um, and there's some stands of Hemlock here in Alabama that have not been hit yet, and it's one of the last remaining stands. Um, so I was going to spend some time up there and and make a book about Hemlocks that uh, also has some like natural dyeing from hemlock bark, hopefully. Oh, that sounds that sounds fascinating. And everyone tonight, I just wanted to remind all of our viewers that, of course, you can purchase any of the works that are on display in the Book is Art and Use exhibition, and the proceeds do go to the Decatur Arts Alliance. And if you'd like to come and peek the gallery, we do have gallery hours on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sundays. You can register to come see the exhibition on our Eventbrite page. And we'll go ahead and make sure that we drop that in the chat for you all. And once again, you can always rewatch these events on our YouTube channel. So I would like to once again, thank you three for joining us this evening. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Stephen. And thank you, Jillian, for sharing your thoughts and your wonderful pieces of art with us. 
Don't forget to once again join us next week for our final artist talk in the Book as Art series exhibition this year. And we look forward to seeing you once again very, very soon. Have a wonderful evening and thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, so much. Thank you very much.